Good afternoon. Uh, like Danielle said, I've been fortunate to take part in and listen to the conversations you've been having over the last couple days, and I'm grateful to you for taking a few minutes to listen to me right now. Uh, so I did a Google search last night for terms, uh, the three terms, Trump, Bernie, and populism. Uh, and here is a sampling of the news headlines that popped up. Irresponsible populist power, Trump and Sanders tap into anti-establishment anger. The populist earthquake, Trump and Sanders overturn American politics. Trump versus Sanders get ready for a populist disaster. And one of my favorites, is populism a dirty word? <laughs> so populism has become a four-letter word today. Populist rhetoric promises to return democracy to its roots in the power of the people. At best, however, we view populist uprisings as episodic or naive. They may offer a barometer of popular discontent, but it's utopian to believe that people can mobilize power to enact meaningful change outside of the channels of government. At worst, we regard populism as reactionary. It's prone to vilifying the enemies of the people and fomenting backlash against elites and marginalized groups. Trump is, in many ways, uh, I agree a fascist, uh, but also <laughs> the latest expression of right-wing populist tradition that includes George Wallace, the Christian right, the Tea Party, and many more. Indeed, before Occupy captured public attention, the most visible and loudest populist energies had been dedicated in recent decades to closing the nation's borders, narrowing who can become a citizen, promoting fiscal austerity, and gutting the institutions of government that do act on behalf of the most marginalized people. So given populism's bad reputation, it's understandable that democratic theorists and activists have been eager to abandon populism to the far right. Cynicism understandably takes root amidst the reality TV show that surrounds Donald Trump's candidacy and the morning after 52% of the British people voted to leave the EU, begging the question, if populism promises to return democracy to the people, what kind of democracy will the people establish? So today I want to enter that uh, conversation and argue that populism has a crucial role to play in reviving democratic theory and practice in the United States. And this requires tapping into a tradition of radical democratic populisms in the United States that have not only mobilized people to resist hierarchical forms of power, but that have also experimented with creating alternative forms of horizontal popular power. So I wanna make three kinds of arguments to support this claim. The first is that a key stake in reclaiming populism isn't just semantic, it has to do with shifting our democratic imagination. So another of my favorite headlines from my Google search, uh, Alexander Hamilton's warning to fans of Trump and Sanders, populism endangers liberty. Uh, so despite Hamilton's new Broadway cachet as a self-made immigrant, <laughs> the historical Hamilton was an elitist who argued for centralized forms of government that gave citizens very little power. And founders like Hamilton were concerned that putting too much power into the hands of the people would be a destabilizing force for government. And contemporary critics of populism have similar concerns. They worry that too much popular unruliness and conflict will disrupt the key institutions of liberal government. And think, for example, of the Tea Party's obstructionist tactics and Occupy's impatience with congressional procedures. When such, ridic when such critics roll out their litany of critiques against populism, however, uh, when they call it angry, irresponsible, and destructive, it often sounds as if they're really chastening us to caution and lower our desires and hopes for democracy. That is, to be satisfied with a modest tinkering of the status quo. Which brings me to my second point, which is that radical democratic populists have not been satisfied with that. There's a rich tradition of democratic populisms at the center and left that have provided spaces for people to experiment with alternative forms of pluralistic popular power. We can find that tradition in the white and black farmers and immigrant laborers who fueled the agrarian cooperative movement and the People's Party of the 19th century. We can see it in the 20th century agitators for the New Deal, civil rights, and the New Left. These movements cultivated people's aspirations not just to resist power, but to share in creating new forms of power across a host of sites and scales, and to do so in ways that hold the definition of the people and the meaning of democracy open to contestation and redefinition. But one thing that's true across these movements that I'm referring to is they succeeded by combining two styles of populist politics that contemporary center and left activists too often want to leave divided. 
So on the one hand, uh, populism as an oppositional rhetoric that mobilizes popular discontent against power. That's crucial to what populism has been. But on the other, populism as a constructive everyday politics that teaches people to wield power. So let me just think about these uh, separately. So on the one hand, populism's oppositional rhetoric offers a familiar emotional script to mobilize the demands of diverse actors against institutions and dynamics that disempower us. Community organizers understand this. What makes you angry is one of the first questions that IAF organizers ask in their relational meetings. And empirical political scientists now show that emotions are vital to motivating people to participate in politics. They help us prioritize which of our needs aren't being met and which of our personal goals and commitments most need public action. That said, mass displays of public outrage of the kind you see in the Tea Party and Occupy are often worrisome to organizers who are involved in the everyday work of building fragile coalitions and trying to make changes within the constraints of local government. We often deride that as bullhorn politics that's disconnected from everyday people. And I'm sympathetic to this argument. To the extent that Occupy did remain disconnected from local organizing in many places, it's easy to see why folks in the trenches for decades, many of them people of color, were wary of a largely white populist movement. And yet, mobilizing large numbers of people behind energetic critique against dramatic wealth imbalances and a democracy that increasingly looks like an oligarchy, it kind of worked. Occupy helped shift public discourse away from years of austerity speak. That had, and it allowed the 2012 Democrats, for example, um, to remind us that government can work for the people. Remember the slogan, we built that, right? Um, and arguably, the energetic critique of Occupy made possible today's Bernie Sanders campaign, right? Um, so that even if it's not uh, changing the everyday institutions of democracy, it's changing the discourse within which we can make policy um, and create change. On the other hand, America's radical democratic populist tradition has also been characterized by its commitment to democratic experimentation. That is, to creating spaces in which everyday actors can develop their civic capacities while steadily building new relationships, resources, and institutions of horizontal popular power. So these are the spaces in which many of us in this room are engaged through our work in community organizing, civic engagement, volunteerism, uh, public work, civic studies, digital participation, and so on. And what many of us have learned is that people need to participate in deep, sustained, repeated practices of deliberating and building relationships across social differences in order to counteract the forces that currently shape us as citizens in this country, right? Especially in an American political culture that encourages individualism, competition, political apathy, and the abdication of responsibility for big problems like poverty and racism. So these everyday populist spaces are vital incubators of new kinds of democratic citizens and of new democratic visions and practices that can inspire broader movements and perhaps even of political friendship um, uh, and uh, kind of um, strategies of receptivity. Okay, um, so yeah, all right. Uh, Two minutes, wow, I had done that, okay. Um, so, so I wanna say that this was true, um, you know, this kind of incubating of ideas and citizenship informing broader movements. Um, we can see it historically, um, but we can also see it in decades of local living wage organizing um, that were incubators for today's national fight for 15. We can see it in organizing for affordable housing, debt relief, um, and so on that were incubators for Occupy. Also, these everyday populist spaces are incubators of pluralist democracy. So one of the striking qualities of democratic populist movements is the ways in which the most marginalized actors, from the black farmers, immigrant laborers, and suffragettes of the People's Party to feminist and queer people of color in Occupy, have used their own experiments in democracy, their local ongoing experiments, to influence broad-based movements for change. And we can see this again in the, in the ways that the movement for black lives is having an influence on the Sanders campaign and the current political climate. Okay, my third point um, is that until recent years, the right has been far more effective in recent decades at combining populism's flair for mass oppositional rhetoric with its lifeblood of grassroots organizing, right? And the most uh, enduring examples of this are the Christian Coalition and the Tea Party. Given the power of talk radio and the right-wing echo chamber, however, it's been difficult for the most promising decentered spaces of those movements um, to impact the whole. 
So for example, tea partiers who teamed up with environmentalists to halt the Keepstone pipeline in the Southwest might have been um, folks you can bring in from the other side uh, in building uh, political movements, but they didn't impact the broader um, movement on the right. Okay? Um, so as I've suggested in a few of the examples, um, promising movements abound on the left. Right? Um, I was going to focus in depth on one, uh, which is the uh, movement around the DREAM Act uh, that became um, a broader movement against deportation. Um, you can see it in Occupy's uh, engagements with local communities. Um, you can see it in a variety of other things. Uh, last word, uh, that um, what I see in these movements and what I hope we see in the upcoming election is proof amidst a right-wing populist backlash that pluralist participatory democracy is still vibrant in this uh, society. Thank you so much.